Good morning, good afternoon, good evening from Doha, and assalamu alaikum. A warm welcome to all of you joining from everywhere in the world to recognize and celebrate innovation in education. Welcome to the 2020 WISE Award celebration titled Building the Future of Education, Conversation with Resilient Innovators. My name is Audrey Jacomini. I'm the manager of the Innovation for Quality and Access track at WISE. Every day, I feel blessed and inspired to be working with innovators from around the world. I'm delighted to be sharing with you some of this inspiration by being the MC for this event. Let me start with some house items first. As you may see, you have a chat feature and a Q&A option at the bottom of your screen. Please use the chat to post comments and the Q&A option to ask questions to the speakers. This will be handy when we open the floor for questions from the audience later. For those who would like to post on social media, please use hashtag WiseAwards as you tweet or post about today. Our handle is at wise underscore tweets. As I onboard you on the topic that we will discuss today, please answer the polls that you will see appearing on your screen. We always like to know a bit more about our audience. So where are you coming from? And what is your role in the education system? The theme of today's event, Building the Future of Education Conversation with Resilience Innovators, reflect on the idea of thinking about education innovation proactively and not reactively. This no longer has to be a point of crisis. We can turn it into a moment of opportunity. The discussion will highlight the efforts undertaken by educational innovators to ensure they provide access to quality education from birth until adult learning and everything in between. We will also celebrate the best educational innovators of 2020, the 2020 WISE Awards winners. With no further introduction, I would like to welcome WISE CEO Savros Yanuka for some introductory remarks. Thank you, Audrey, and a very warm welcome from me to everyone joining us from around the world to celebrate the 2020 WISE Awards that recognize outstanding innovation uh, in education. I, I want in particular to acknowledge the presence of Her Highness Sheikh Hamza bin Nasser, Chairperson of Qatar Foundation and the Education Above All Foundation, uh, without whose vision and leadership, we would not be here today. Welcome and thank you, Your Highness. Now, the primary purpose uh, of the WISE Awards, which Qatar Foundation, under the leadership of Her Highness, inaugurated in 2009, is not only to recognize and celebrate innovation in education. Rather, the awards are also a repository of global best practices that send out a clear, and consistent message that even under the most difficult conditions, solutions to education challenges exist and are being applied on a daily basis by education entrepreneurs and innovators from around the world. Since 2009, WISE has recognized 72 such innovations. They and the teams that are behind them uh, together with dozens of worthy uh, finalists, form the core of a global community of real change makers in education. Their work gives us hope that despite the setbacks caused by conflict, natural and man-made disasters, and now the ubiquitous pandemic, we can and will recover and continue striving towards the sustainable development goal of quality education for all. Now, even the most innovative and entrepreneurial educators cannot act alone. We need governments, and why not even large corporations and philanthropic foundations to come together and deploy the resources and organizational know-how to effectively and efficiently scale proven solutions like the six that we are celebrating today. Now with that, it gives me great pleasure to introduce our keynote speaker for the day, 
Stefania Giannini is the Assistant Director General of Education at UNESCO and a former Senator and Minister of Education, Universities and Research in her native Italy, where, as if this were not achievement enough, she was also one of the first and the youngest woman to hold the position of University President at Perugia. At UNESCO, Stefania leads the coordination and monitoring of the implementation of the Education 2030 Agenda that is encapsulated in Sustainable Development Goal 4. Stefania, welcome, and the mic is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Stavros, uh, Excellencies, uh, and dear friends. Uh, it's really a great pleasure for me to be here with you today and have the honor to to deliver this, uh, this um, keynote speech uh, in a wise world event. The wise words are always a bright spot on my candle, let me say. Uh, this year, the prize winners renew my faith in a vibrant future for education, one that is more inclusive, more equitable, more relevant, and more engaging. Having said that, uh, the in general reflected in the winning project reminds me how many talented people and committed organizations are breathing new life into education and getting us uh, somehow closer towards the aspiration of sustainable development goal number four and this commitment to leave no one behind. This moment uh, of celebration and optimism uh, is uh, particularly welcome this year. As everyone listening today is aware, we are in the middle of the greatest global disruption to education in history. Progress uh, we have made over decades is um, revealing and sadly and is not yet in sight. France, where UNESCO is headquartered, where I am addressing you from today, saw more COVID-19 infections this past week than any other point in the pandemic. We are waiting uh, anxiously uh, to listen to President Macron this evening uh, telling uh, the country and uh, community uh, how measures maybe, uh, maybe uh, will be renewed and uh, more severe in the coming days. A curfew is in effect already more restriction uh, yeah, are expected uh, in, the coming, uh, in the coming days. Sadly, much of the world is on a similar trajectory and an academic year that be began with the promise of a return to school, uh, reopening schools uh, is still one of the main topics that the entire education community is addressing as run head first into reality on the health crisis once again. On again, off again, school closure, uh, now nearing a year in duration, uh, have weakened connections to formal edition for hundreds of millions of learners. We know numbers, I don't want to repeat once and today. At UNESCO, we have a chronicle alarming and corresponding rises in child labor, early marriages, abuse, strife, neglect and neglect not to mention steep learning losses and strain uh, on families. Heroic endeavors uh, to, to pivot education systems uh, to distance learning uh, almost overnight uh, have helped some students maintain links to learning, but massive gaps remain. And continuity of learning has been from the very beginning of the crisis, our common mission within the international education community. Our solutions, most often dependent on technology, are functioning to accelerate educational inequity. And inequalities uh, must be uh, addressed uh, more than ever as inequalities are uh, at risk to be amplified by this crisis. In my position, I attend many crisis meetings where people propose uh, strategies uh, and solution to confront our immediate predicament, they almost always uh, end with recognition that new out of the box, so to say, ideas are needed. And there is a growing acceptance uh, that we cannot return to a status quo, to a business as usual model that is so susceptible to future shocks, especially 
this, this week, we can say like this. As Wise has rightly pointed out, we need to stop morally reacting to latest pandemic disruption, and we should rather direct more energy and force to proactively build in the future we want for teaching and learning, mindful of our current challenges, but also what lies beyond these challenges. Shocks can invite innovation, can provoke innovation somehow, but they can also narrow our approach. It's a question of the way we address shocks and crises. That is why I so admire, honestly, this year's wise prize winners. They keep the big feature in focus, in addition to giving us ideas, new solutions for how to respond to immediate challenges. It's about bringing and bridging the here and now dimension with the, the near future. Collectively, the programs we will we'll celebrate today are helping us rethink education, what is, is uh, how it is practices, and uh, who it is for, in order to expand its reach and enlarge its impact, especially for those most likely to be left behind. I'm particularly struck by the extent to which uh, the winning projects see learning as lifelong and life-wide process. Beneficiaries are not just children, but also adult women in India, inmates in Kenya and Uganda, parents in China, teachers in South Sudan and Kenya, and educators in countries in the Americas. This work is moving, uh, is moving us toward a future where learning, far from being uh, concentrated exclusively in the early years of life, is more episodic, something people experience regularly through their lives. This is the real, true, lifelong learning dimension that somehow the 2030 Agenda and, and, uh, and um, uh, SDG4 launched some years ago. The projects further show that education can and should help communities as well as individuals in the process. For example, just to mention something I, I still have in my mind, looking at, at uh, the, the, the prize winners uh, uh, work has been done. Work of the Barefoot College, a long time UNESCO partner, demonstrates how skills development, financial literacy can empower individual women while also helping them shift their communities to clean energy through the introduction to solar panels. It's a concrete example, and we can multiply that. Similarly, the other 2020 um, prize winners established connection between education and justice, education and peace, education and gender equality, education and responsible citizenship, and the education for entrepreneurship. If there is one thing all prize winners understand, it's about uh, uh, looking for a clear red line with cost cutting uh, all their work, is, it is that education on top for being a human right enable to pursue it of other rights and goals, including the full slate of the sustainable development goals. It's about considering education somehow the premise the precondition to reach all the other rights and goals. I wish to end my remarks uh, then by encouraging, strongly encouraging this community of innovators to help, to help us uh, confront the severity of our present emergency while simultaneously constructing new horizons, new possibilities uh, and uh, new options uh, for uh, the future in education and pulling and pulling us, all, all of us as a community, into the future we want. It's not a neither or choice. It's both. One of my favorite definitions of innovation, let me say very simply, is that um, creativity, um, innovation is uh, creativity with a job to do. 
So it's about thinking and reimagining what we are doing, but also having a job to be done. It's the application of a novel concept that aspires to change education in particular context and in a positive, concrete way. At this difficult time um, and in this very difficult year, we all have a job to do. It's a clear job. And we all need the creativity to help us to do the job and help us to do it well, effectively, as the community around us require, it's a request us to do. Let's find inspiration in the ways these years wise awards winners have channeled their creativity to improve and strengthen education. Having said that, I thank you very much for the opportunity to address uh, this uh, amazing community of innovators and uh, educators and congratulations to the prize winners uh, for their excellent work. Thank you very much, uh, Mrs. Giannini and Ansabros for these inspiring words, uh, reminding us that education is really at the center of everything. Uh, rethinking education to provide access uh, to quality education is crucial and supporting innovation in the way is, is the first step. So thank you very much for your uh, inspiring words. Um, that being said, it's now time to discover and celebrate how the 2020 WISE Awards winners are tackling a number of pressing educational issues. In the last few months, resilience, defined as the capacity to recover quickly from difficulties, has come up in many discussions. Thus, in this session, while we celebrate them, each 2020 WISE Awards winner will share their moment of resilience, how they face challenges and learn to adapt, becoming the project we celebrate today. To start, let's discover a video about the first winning project, Barefoot College Solar Electrification with Enrich Education, which will be followed by Megan Fellons, former CEO, now non-executive director of Barefoot, of Barefoot College International, Resilience Moment. Access to affordable energy worldwide remains unequal across regions. Women disproportionately bear the burden of energy poverty. This prevents them from engaging in other income generating or educational activities throughout their day. Increasing women's access to electricity can unlock their entrepreneurial capabilities and develop their independence. Barefoot College has transformed the lives of the rurally poor by training disadvantaged women to become solar engineers. They have contributed to the electrification of entire villages. The solar program is only the start of the journey these women take to lead their families and their communities out of poverty. Barefoot College also launched the Enrich program, which pairs with the solar program to provide a holistic education that teaches women additional soft skills, empowering them to better manage their resources and health. Women who took part in this program in India and Indonesia were able to increase their income with 54 and 70% respectively. Barefoot College is a pioneer in sustainable education models on renewable energy. Their holistic intervention empowers women to become agents of change within their communities and for generations to come. Again, the floor is yours. You are muted, Megan. <laughs> Sorry, there we go. Namaste. On behalf of each and every member of the Barefoot College International family, 
We are deeply grateful for the honor of this award and to be amongst such an amazing group of current and past awardees. Over 15 years ago, we started training women from India and other countries as solar engineers to fabricate, install, and maintain solar home lighting systems in their rural communities. We called them solar mamas. What made this program so unique is that these were illiterate and semi-literate women taught by non-formally trained teachers. Thousands of women have been able to Thousands of women mastered a technology that had previously been reserved only for those formally educated. By 2015, we had expanded into more than 60 countries and trained nearly 2,000 solar mamas. It was by all means a success story. However, in closely listening to the women, we realized that we hadn't gone far enough. In fact, the women had become proud and capable leaders in their communities, but they remained unable to pay for their children's school, to buy a bicycle, or to pursue their economic dreams. Without money and consistent earnings, their skills had brought them respect of a kind and indeed gender equality in their communities, but not enough agency to reach their aspirations. It was hard for my team to accept this. We didn't want to believe we were falling short. We began to rethink our approach pretty dramatically. And this led to a realization that the formal skills that, uh, that they were having, uh, we realized that by not having a formal education and being faced so often with crises, stigma, and lack of resources, Many of them had not developed sound critical thinking skills and were therefore making poor decisions when engaging in their micro entrepreneurial activities. From this realization, the Enrich curriculum was born. It includes eight pillars of holistic learning that complete the technical skills, giving women a 360 degree sense of their environment, their bodies, their rights, and their economic possibilities. The curriculum itself helps women to recognize the power, knowledge, and potential that they already have while building on local resource structures. Most importantly, the curriculum was co-created with them because in the process, we have humbly learned that nothing instills dignity in a woman who has previously felt invisible like really being heard. The inherent inequality in the lack of learning opportunities for women who have never had access to formal education is actually absurd in an age when we have all the knowledge and technology needed to level that playing field. Every woman deserves to learn and to prosper, even if she cannot read or write. So this, this recognition, this is really for them, for the solar mamas, for the women of the Enrich program, for the incredible Barefoot College International team, and for all those who have supported us and accompanied us through this journey of mutual learning and extreme impact. Thank you. Thank you so much, Megan, and, and congratulations once again, and congratulations for also your continuous efforts to empower women. Uh, let's move on now to our second winner, uh, Sawisha Instructional Leadership Institute. Deborah Kimathi, Executive Director of Dignitas Project, will share some of her insights after, show, after this video. Children in marginalized communities in Kenya go to informal community schools that are under-resourced and lack skilled teachers. These schools are often unable to offer quality learning, leading to many children leaving school without the skills they need to thrive and succeed. Sawisha Leadership Institute from Dignitas strengthens community effort and raises the bar for education in marginalized communities through one-year school partnerships that offer training to school leadership teams. 
Selected schools enroll their head teachers and emerging teacher leaders in the Stawisha Leadership Institute. They then participate in ongoing workshops, communities of practice, classroom-based mentoring, and individual coaching. The program focuses on three critical levers for improved learning, instructional leadership, classroom culture, and learner engagement. After one year, the school leaders have improved competencies in domains like self-efficacy, pedagogy, and leadership. They are also equipped to assist other teachers in their lesson planning and delivery. Unsurprisingly, students benefit most from the improved teaching quality. They get a better chance to develop essential competencies and strength of character to thrive and succeed. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. It is indeed an honor and a privilege to be here um, amongst uh, not just colleagues and friends, but indeed the other uh, winners of the WISE Awards. Um, my journey with Stawisha started late 2017 as I joined Dignitas as the new executive director. Dignitas itself was at an interesting point in its journey with its co-founder having just stepped down from the role. And I faced a twofold challenge of leading the team to refine Sawisha for scale and growth in a manner that deepens impact. And secondly, the challenge to bring new partners and funders on board who would invest in that growth. At the time, it was costing us approximately $82 per child per year to implement Sawisha through school partners. And our school support team of four we're supporting just 21 schools. Two years later, I'm immensely proud to say that it costs us just $12 per child per year. And we have a team of six now supporting 120 schools. How? Well, we took four key steps. Step one was to refocus our vision. We spent time as a team making sure that we were united and had clarity of vision. We revisited our assumptions about the problems we were trying to solve. We revisited our values and we restated what we believed our solution needed to achieve. Step two, identify what really works. We had an external evaluation of our work conducted. Our vision statement is that every school should be a vibrant place for all children to thrive and succeed. And our big question as we embarked on the evaluation was what drives the most impact for learners. This process was pivotal in informing questions about critical levers of change and helped us to understand where we should focus our resources. With this in mind, we were able to refine Stawisha from a two-year institute that tackled seven broad domains to a one-year institute that went much deeper on three critical domains that were sure to transform learning. Step three was to drive efficiency. Across the organization, we sought ways to integrate technology, leverage collaboration, and streamline processes so that our operations were as cost and time efficient as possible. Everything from school partner outreach to data collection and analysis was strategically considered with this in mind. And finally, step four, grow networks. I truly believe we are stronger together. In a world that so often pushes us to compete with other actors, our approach was to collaborate. We established partnerships that were focused on what we could learn and achieve together by understanding and complementing each other's strengths. And what did we learn in this process? That the route to resilience is agility and that the foundation of agility is a laser focus on vision. These are lessons that have served us immensely well amidst the chaos of 2020. And as a result, we've been resilient in the face of constant change and complex uncertainty. Our latest report shows that in 2020, 98% of our school leaders have gained new competencies and have in turn equipped 97% of their parents to support learning at home. 
As a result, they've curbed learning losses through school closures, reduced parent and child and anxiety, and increased the amount of learning at home. And so it is with immense pleasure that I share uh, in the joy of the other uh, participants here today. And I want to share that with my team who are joining us. A huge thank you to them for making this work possible. And of course, to the WISE community. Thank you, everyone. Thank you uh, very much, Deborah, for reminding us about the importance of having a common North Star for greater impact. And really, congratulations again. Um, I have the pleasure next to introduce Pirating the Future, represented by Sabrina Peng, funding member and head of board of supervisor of Rupan Modu Foundation. Let's watch together a video about the project before hearing from Sabrina. Many children in rural China who live in poverty-stricken areas suffer from deficient early learning. This leaves them on a path of developmental delay with a higher likelihood of continuing the vicious cycle of intergenerational poverty. Rural caregivers often have low levels of education themselves and don't know the importance of interactive parenting. Parenting the Future aims to break this poverty cycle. They train local women as childcare coaches who then teach caregivers the importance of early brain development. The step-by-step -step curriculum is delivered at centers in villages or at family homes through group and individual sessions. It aims to improve the social, emotional, cognitive, motor and language skills of six to 36 month old children. Currently cooperating with local government in two counties, the project wants to scale up its services to all poverty afflicted counties in China by 2030. Parenting the Future is unique because it links women's empowerment to local employment and children's development. The local women who become childcare coaches gain professional skills, earn revenue to support their own families, and contribute to breaking the cycle of poverty in their own communities. Sabrina, the floor is yours. Hello? Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Audrey. Yeah. So can you see me? Because I cannot turn on the video. We can't see you, but we can hear you. So. OK. Yeah, now, perfect. We can see okay. you now. <laughs> perfect. Thank you. Thank you, Audrey. It is super honor to be here today. The video brings back a lot of memories. Today, I would like to share with you two unforgettable moments during this amazing journey. Three years ago, Lucy Peng initiated the idea of setting up a foundation to help children in rural areas in China. After four rounds discussions, we finally picked Parent in the Future to be the project that the foundation decided to all in. Actually, this project was killed in the first round of selection. Why? Because early childhood development and early education for zero to three years old is a concept that is not well known, even in the cities. We wondered that can't really be accepted in rural areas. Moreover, this is not a project that will generate immediate impact. How long will it take for us to see the positive outcomes? more discussions we had, deeper understanding of where do we come from? Where do we want to go? We realized that our original intention of building Hupan Model Foundation is bring the equal opportunity of development for children and break the poverty cycle in rural areas. PTF, Parent in the Future, is a project which can solve the inequality problem from the root. In these following years, we never stop feeling that we are so lucky to have made this right choice at that time. 
Although we expected it to be difficult from the beginning, the challenge was even greater than we had imagined. After our team's very hard working for a few months, we finally managed to get 63% of the local households to receive our service regularly. But the coverage could not be higher anymore, no matter how hard we tried. Families in more remote areas could not reach our service center due to lack of public transportation. Our parenting coaches also are kept out of the door when paying home visits because the, uh, the caregivers d just did not trust us. Some of them even thought we, we were cheats. We also faced the challenge of the safety for our staff. One of our coaches fell from her motorcycle while riding to a village to do home visit along a mountain road. Some of us thought of giving up to reach the last mile because it was easier to replicate this model to other countries and counties to serve more children who also need help. Striving to reach the very last mile costs higher and requires more efforts and resilience. However, our local operation team, I'm so proud of them, they believe one can always find more solutions than problems. We shall leave no one behind, no matter how difficult it is. We shall not create even more inequality. Thankfully, through active participation of local governments, our parenting coaches were well promoted and trusted. We improved the protection plan for our home visit coaches. We also expanded the functions of our digital platform and provided online services. These developments boosted the service rate sharply and it has since stabilized about 90%. Believing is seeing. Today, three years later, the project has made much progress and drawn some attention. However, there are still 18 million children under the age of three in China's rural areas. We hope that our efforts and innovations can inspire and attract more people to join us to help these children, because we always know in our hearts that when we believe, we will see. Thank you. Thank you, Sabrina, for this amazing example of resilience and congratulations again. The next Thank project you. I would like to introduce is Education for Sharing. Dina Bushbinder, founder of, the, of Education for Sharing, will share resilience moments just after the video. Millions of children experience school violence every year. And all too often, education systems don't have the tools to respond to these social challenges. Education for Sharing aims to bridge this gap with play-based learning on issues like social justice, equality, empathy, and responsibility. A lack of training and availability of resources sometimes make teachers feel unequipped to implement play-based learning. But Education for Sharing partners with schools to train teachers on how to use games in fields like sports, arts and science to impart civic values and raise SDG-related competencies. The teaching model is specifically adapted to respond to the needs and concerns of each community. Learning through play generates a safe environment where students can feel uninhibited to share their reflections, concerns and doubts. This makes them feel important and confident enough to take action and change their daily realities. Now the floor is yours. On behalf of the, all the Education for Sharing team, Equipo Educación para Compartir, 
wholeheartedly thank you for this honor and huge congratulations to our 2020 fellow awardees. I was born in a country like most of us where kids and young people were not used to participate. In fact, one in every five students stated that they had little to no opportunity to participate. Did you feel useful or valuable when you went to school? I didn't particularly feel useful or valuable during my years of going to school. I didn't even understand why I was going to school. You know, I never liked to sit still at school. When it came to learning, I usually found myself in my element when I was playing and exploring new possibilities. I needed to move and play to connect and learn, but instead I was passively receiving information. Does this ring a bell? What was your experience like going to school? To think that we can change the way we learn at school through play can sound naive or even silly. I know that because 13 years ago, when I said to my peers in university, this was going to be my job, to bring play as a means to learn in the education systems, they would almost laugh at me and say, oh, Dina, you're so sweet. So what are you really going to do for work? I didn't settle for that. I fought for more. I stood up for what I believed in. In fact, this did not only became my real job, it became my life's purpose. I have truly felt useful in this path of an education for sharing. My team and I can tell you 1.3 million stories. Today, I chose one that's very close to my heart, one of the most exciting moments in my life. It was when I heard a 10-year-old girl, Regina, who after going through our methodology, chose as her favorite sustainable development goal, climate action. She said she was going to do a campaign to take care of water in her community. Months after, when kids presented their initiative to their community, she said, this is the first time in my life I feel useful. Regina realized that she is a change agent and she learned this by playing. This meant to me, there is hope to transform education systems as we know them. One child, one teacher, one parent at a time, leaving no one behind. Education can be rich, exciting, awakening, useful, meaningful. It can activate curiosity and teamwork. It can be a source of inspiration and of understanding why we choose to practice values to see the agent of change that we all have inside, to be true global citizens in our, in our relationships and our planet. We need to connect with joy to participate and play, my friends, is a very powerful vehicle to connect with joy. There is no justification for leaving anyone behind. Do you think that Regina's life will be different because she discovered she is useful and valuable for her community and for her world from a young age? What difference would it make if all of us grew up knowing that we have a role to play in this world? Thank you, Wise, for acknowledging the, pos the possibility of an education for sharing for all. Thank you very much, Dina, and congrats again also on making education a joyful experience for children. Um, the next presenter, uh, Alexander McLean, founder of Justice Defender, is also pushing boundaries to provide education to all. Let's first watch a short video about this project. The lack of meaningful access to justice impacts nearly two of every three people worldwide. This is no different in Kenya and Uganda, where correctional facilities operate far above their intended capacity. Many prisoners in these facilities are unduly incarcerated due to a lack of legal services at their disposal. Justice defenders work to empower those most in need of justice to access it for themselves. Their three-week intensive training educates inmates to become auxiliary paralegals. Prison officers are also eligible to join the paralegal program. After graduating, these paralegals hold mock hearings to help their fellow inmates prepare for trial and also consult on their cases. 
Some graduates go on to earn a Bachelor of Laws degree from the University of London through distance learning. Justice Defenders is the only organization to have established a structured program run by inmates to decongest Kenyan and Ugandan prisons. The program restores agency to incarcerated individuals, giving them the confidence to help themselves and their fellow inmates. Alexander, the floor is yours. We can't see you or hear you. Hello, everyone. Yes. Justice Defenders defends justice with defenseless communities through legal education, training, and practice. Proximity is core to our work. We believe that certain things can only be seen through eyes that have cried. Our community of prisoners, prison officers, lawyers, judges, academics and allies shares life and breaks bread with each other. My wife, children and I started this year living in Kenya and considered it a privilege as a family to spend time in prison and with those from prison. In March, the COVID pandemic caused the doors of the prisons we work in to be locked shut. It was no longer possible for justice defenders or other organizations or even prisoners' families to access prisons. As a result of government restrictions, as a foreigner, I wasn't allowed back into Kenya to join my family after traveling overseas. COVID has created many possibilities for disconnect, for retreat literally into our own bubbles. And yet it's in times of crisis that we need each other more than ever before, especially those in our most vulnerable communities, including people in prison. Outside of prison, many of us, including women like my wife, Hannah, who was six months pregnant when I got locked out of Kenya, also felt exposed. Having worked all my life in prisons, my understanding of our common humanity is that we're always invited to reach out to each other to build bridges, to only connect. As justice defenders, we knew that it was more important in COVID than ever before to show up in the prison communities we are part of. Technology allowed us to deliver paralegal training and University of London law classes to prisoners and prison officers remotely for the first time. Our COVID response included establishing a fines fund, which paid for the release of more than 100 minor offenders, including pregnant women and mothers in prison with their children, who were imprisoned for being too poor to pay fines. To help keep the wheels of justice turning, we facilitated online court sessions for thousands of prisoners. In results just released, we saw a 90% pass rate for our University of London law exams this summer with four prison-based students securing first-class marks and another four completing their law degrees in the midst of COVID. 2020 has highlighted global inequality and the fact that we're not all equally protected by and accountable to the law. We each have a chance now to ask, what kind of world do we want to live in post-COVID and what part will we play in building it? As for my family, my wife and children were able to leave Kenya before international flights were stopped. A series of generous friends offered us places to live in London. We learned something of what it means to live open-handed and we were gifted with a healthy son, Elliot. On behalf of all my brothers and sisters at Justice Defenders, I'm delighted to receive this award and to invite you to find opportunities to create unlikely allies. As much as life's hurdles, including a pandemic, might strip away many of the things we hold dear, the investment we make in educating ourselves and others and loving each other can never be taken away. Thank you, Alexander, for those very inspiring words and, and for really pushing boundaries. Congratulations again. Um, last but not least, um, I would like us to celebrate Think Equal and its founder, Leslie Edwin.
nearly all of us are suffering by some form of discrimination. The consequences of inequality are long-lasting, not only for individuals, but also for communities and countries at large. According to scientists, the neuroplasticity of the developing brain at ages 3 to 6 presents an optimal window for modifying behaviours and attitudes. Think Eco wants to break the cycle of negative stereotypes and prejudice and give children the foundation for positive and pro-social attitudes in later life by putting social and emotional learning at the core of early years education. This also helps to promote well-being and combat future mental health issues. The Think Equal program teaches moral, psychosocial and emotional competencies to three to six-year-old children three times a week for three entire school years. Children are engaged by narrative picture books that open on exciting worlds, celebrating diversity of people and stories from all over the globe. The program's prescriptive plug-and-play ACL lessons are easily embedded and scaled across contexts and countries without adding to the workload of teachers. Teachers implementing Think Equal observe daily and at times dramatic behavioral changes in their children. Like in Botswana, kids are measurably more skilled in emotional behavior than their peers who did not participate in the program. More than 77,000 children across six continents and 14 countries have benefited so far from Think Equal resources, training and support. I'm deeply, deeply honoured and this award is given to the entire team of Think Equal. It's given to all of our funders, our supporters. We couldn't have made a single one of these steps without all of you. Uh, our volunteers, our boards in two countries, in the US and the UK, and your highness, shukran, wise, you are an extraordinary community. And thank you so much for this honor. I'm also so humbled. I've been so inspired listening to the speeches. What co-awardees, I mean, this just pretty much doubles the honor. Um, so we've all been asked to, to focus on a challenge. Of course, when you have your sights set on uh, disseminating a program globally, you have a lot of challenges. Um, so I've just plumbed for focusing on the first challenge that I recall experiencing. And there was a huge challenge, um, which, which actually I fully expect to continue to have to face until every child in every classroom, in every country in the world has the right given and, and empowered that inalienable right that every child has to positive outcomes in life through a foundation in social and emotional learning. And that challenge is this, that the most important subject in the world, social and emotional learning, which nurtures our children to be inclusive, loving, kind, gender and racially equal, empathetic, responsible global citizens who value one another and our common home, the earth. That subject is missing from the outmoded education system that we are expected to make do with. Now this challenge was apparent from the outset. How do we achieve implementation of a program because the, the, the entire workforce in most parts of the world is underpaid in early years, untrained and certainly undervalued. And this is a new subject. So how on earth could we overnight hope to get teachers to learn how to teach social emotional competencies 
to curate the materials or, or even just to understand, to take just one of the 25 competencies we teach, critical thinking, to understand what this even means, let alone how to teach it. So the way I set about solving this problem was by taking inspiration from Ikea, <laughs> noticing that you don't have to be a carpenter who has gone to cabinet making college for four years to be able to put up an Ikea bookshelf. You go to the warehouse, you pick up your flat pack, you pay very little for it, and you go home, you read the instructions, and there you go, you put up the bookshelf. Um, and by the way, Ikea, I think you need to talk to me about a corporate partnership with Think Equal after this. Um, and of course, you also set up branches in every country in the world. And so it was that with the help of the most extraordinary world experts like that giant who walked the earth for far too short a time, Sir Ken Robinson, we have created a plug and play program that is prescriptive, it has to be. We give our teachers and practitioners the packs of 22 narrative picture books that we've created that don't have a single girl in pink or a single boy in blue, a single woman washing dishes at a sink, a single man with a briefcase, etc. And along with these 22 picture books, the 90 lesson plans and the 50 plus resources for each one of the three age appropriate levels that we've designed for three to six year olds. That is our trench, that is our focus. So did the challenge disappear? Well, no, it just shifted onto the so-called developing countries. And I say so-called because I actually don't believe there is a single developed country in this world yet when it comes to values and moral compass. So now I'm faced with a challenge of jargon, glib phrases, and limited pedagogical definitions like, oh, uh, we don't believe in prescriptive. We only do child-led free play, which means we only teach young children what they show curiosity in. Well, that's a shame, really, because personally, I've never come across a three-year-old who's interested in gender equality, have you? So ultimately, when I face the sometimes overwhelming challenges of trying to scale a global system change in education to every child in every classroom, in every country in the world, I remind myself of two very inspiring quotes, which I want to end with, and this is what gets me through it. Nelson Mandela, who said, no human being is born hating another because of the color of his skin, his religion, or any other factor. A child has to be taught to hate. And if he can learn to hate, he can be taught to love. And Martin Luther King, who said, the ultimate measure of a man is not where he stands in moments of comfort and convenience, but where he stands at moments of challenge and controversy. Now, of course, had both of these extraordinary men been taught think equal as children, they would not have confined their beautiful and eloquent quotes to he, his, and man. Thank you. Thank you very much, Leslie, and thank you for sharing those uh, very inspiring quotes and, and your journey also to bring uh, social emotional learning to all. Uh, and congratulations once again to all the 2020 WISE Awards winners. We will now move on to the trophy ceremony. And for that, I would like to invite my colleague, Sana El Salabi, in charge of the WISE Awards, to join me to hand over the trophies. I know even if the winners won't hear you, uh, won't hear you, yes, I invite you to cheer them on from wherever you are. They really deserve it. So really uh, cheer them on. And I will start um, the trophy ceremony with Barefoot College Solar Electrification with Enriched Education. Megan and Sana.
Sawisha Instructional Leadership Institute. Parenting the future. Education for sharing. Justice defenders. Think equal. Really congratulations to all of you. Uh, since this is the closest we can be together at this time, uh, we will still try to take a picture all together as it is in our tradition. And for that, I will also um, invite Stavros Yanuka to join, um, join us for the picture and ask all of you to show to your camera the trophy. Congratulations really once again. Congratulations, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Um, and congrats. We will now uh, move on to our next segment uh, to, and to celebrate the six awards winners. We have the pleasure to welcome Dana Al-Fardan, Qatar's leading female contemporary composer. Also a song, songwriter and symphonic artist, drawing on her rich cultural heritage and influenced by her love of world music. Her work is a blend of Arab influenced contemporary classical, epic in scale and universally accessible. Dana will share with us today for the first time a piece of a new musical about the poet Rumi which also addresses the topic of resilience. Her music will be performed by Nadim Naman, West End actor and co-writer. Dana, the floor is yours for some introductory words and of course music. Ladies and gentlemen, wise award winners, distinguished guests, it's a pleasure to be here with you today, um, albeit digitally, in the wake of the most challenging period in our collective history. And in this period, there's never been a time in which it's more important to cultivate and unlock our own infinite source of potential creative power and strength. And that's where resilience is born. That's where we can meet every changing landscape in front of us and actually establish a way of being and approaching things that allows us to always act in the most constructive manner and aligned with our own path. And because of that, I've been very blessed to have been working on my upcoming musical Rumi, which is based around all of these principles. So without further ado, I leave you with the two songs in Rumi. The first one is Find My Guide, which is the character of Shems. And the second one is sung by Rumi, which is called Like Lightning. I hope you enjoy the show.
scars be truly healed. Only within another's love is the face of God inside my mind as well this is proof of life you're here and now your soul with mine can dwell this is no ordinary friendship we are merged transcending time i will share with you the secrets we'll dispel the day we die Dana and Nadim for this very beautiful moment and for also introducing us to Rumi's work. We are really looking forward to uh, the opening of your musical in London in, in 2021. And until then, we wish you all the best for the final rehearsals. We will now move on to our next session uh, titled Fire Chats with Innovators. And those innovators, you know them, they are our 2020 Wise Awards winner. 
And where we, what we would like to do during this fire chat is to see and to understand how they are addressing challenges in their own context to innovation and highlight some of their specificities. And for the first fire chat, we will focus on early childhood education and the power of play. So for that, I would like to invite Leslie, Sabrina, and Dina to join me. And here I would like to remind the audience to post your question on the Q&A uh, feature. We will take some of them at the end of our uh, discussion. So all three of your organization are providing solutions to children and recognize the power of play to foster social emotional learning, gender equality, and peaceful conflict resolution skills from an early age, as we've seen in the video earlier. So let me start with you, Leslie. How can we make social emotional learning a subject as important as literacy and numeracy to the eye of the general public? And so that it's taught at a young age everywhere. But also how can teachers be involved in the process? Well, I think the answer to that is we simply need to take steps, active steps. Um, I, I cannot overemphasize how important this is. As a world, we tend to take comfort in making uh, frameworks, making plans, measuring from this side and that side, having conferences, discussing, and we have to take active steps because the work itself speaks for itself. So, you know, we've got more than 60 years now of absolute cast iron and, and fortifying evidence that for every point higher, for example, of social emotional learning in the early years, a child is 86% less likely to ever come into contact in a meaningful, threatening way with the police force is 72%, don't, don't hold me to these, but they're very close, but uh, I'm not reading this right, from memory, something like 72% more likely to finish college with a degree. I mean, we know all this, we've known it for years, and all of our wise declarations, our uh, human rights declaration, our convention on the rights of the child, they all talk about this. They all say education must be directed to the whole personality of the child. We just, for some reason, have blindly been sleepwalking through this and haven't done it. So how can we do it? By doing it. I know that sounds ridiculously obvious, but you know, every classroom that we implement Think Equal in, and we are now in more than 3,000 classrooms around 14 countries. We're about to add 15,000 classrooms in Rajasthan. We're about to add 2,350 classrooms in the entire Eastern Cape province in South Africa, working with the government. Now, how do we get there? We get there because we do pilot programs. They come and see how powerful the work is. They hear from the teachers. You asked about how we get teachers involved. The teachers are everything here. They are the conduit. And, you know, we are blessed. I'll say something a tad controversial. That's always interesting. Um, <laughs> we are blessed that 99% of the teachers in the early years are women. And we're blessed by that. Why? Because everyone is programmed until everyone learns to think equal, until the mindset is changed by this program and programs like it, we will continue to be, you know, <laughs> prejudiced, discriminating in our mindset, um, have negative outcomes in our lives. And so th the bottom line is that these teachers, these women are programmed to nurture. And when they get the tools in their hands that have been put together by the brilliant minds in this field, I mean, they cry with gratitude. And then within a few months, they're seeing major transformations in their children. You don't need more than that. They tell teachers they know, those teachers, the parents tell each other, you, have you got that amazing, the ruler program? You know, have you got that mood meter thing that put it up on your wall, it's amazing. And that's how it grows. That's how we'll get it done by doing it. Thank you very much, Leslie. And I, and I will come back to you a bit later, but I just want also to hear from Sabrina because Sabrina, you've been able to scale also your early childhood uh, uh, intervention 
uh, to a couple of countries in, in China through public-private partnership. And that's a very strong component there. So what can other innovators learn from your model to scale early childhood intervention? Thank you. So Parenting the Future is an effort involving many important partners, including the Executive Leadership Training Center of the National Health Commission, the Center of Experimental Economics in Education and the Shanxi Normal University, and the local governments, organizations, and the business leaders. So you can see it's a lot of people that work from different acts together. So we benefit a lot from that not just us to stand alone fighting for this. We all take ownership of this. So that's very important for, for us to, to support the, the project. Coupon Model Foundation is the coordinator and facilitator. The public-private partnership provides local government more ownership, which has been critical for assuring PTF's efficiency, efficacy, and sustainability. So I went to to the counties, the first uh, county, we had the whole county experiment there. So the local uh, governors there, they're so excited about this. It looks like they own this project and they try to solve every problem there. So that's, I think it's the very key uh, success factors for this project. This is very critical and also for fostering public confidence in the project and in evidence-based social programs generally. So we, we, we really think that that's helpful for us and I hope that will be inspiring for other you know, organizations if they can find partners locally. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Sabrina. And I have a follow-up question for you because also one aspect that is standing out from your program is the use of the digital platform and how it comes to feed your programmatic um, elements and how you're constantly revising your program. Um, can you just explain a little bit more on how you've been integrating and, and really waiving research and uh, the operational components so that you make the, the program as effective as possible? Okay. So PTF started as a research project so the research team played a, a very critical role in identifying the problem initially and in deepening our understanding of it as we implemented the project. So maybe you remembered, I just mentioned our partners, they have their uh, uh, education at Shanxi Normal University. So the professor there, they had a great team. So we, we just uh, based on the research project then we built the, the, the even bigger project. So that's very important for us. And the digi uh, digitalization actually can like the gene of us because the founders of this uh, foundation, we are all from internet industry. So the first day we, 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 we came up with this uh, idea, we think, you know, so anything, the, the, the data technology, you know, the and can really improve you know, the project. So that's the gene of our blood. So, so really we believe digitalization can improve the research efficiency. Uh, for example, during an evaluation research, we found that doing an average amount of 2.7 times on home visits intervention every month can effectively improve the children's development. But because we have a system and uh, uh, the coaches and also the families. So they check in and check out. And so we have some basic data of their uh, activities. So we easily get this number. This type of evidence is very important so that the data will be collected via, via this platform and help us to better improve the project and the efficiency and the guarantee the effectiveness of the scale up process. So, and also this di digital platform uh, tightens our connection with the families. Uh, during the coronavirus ep ex uh, epidemic, coaches kept in touch with parents and taught them how to use all kinds of things at home to make toys. 
because before that they went to our centers, they can use parts there, but now they cannot. So we use this to, 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 to train them and conduct such activities with them and their children. We see a very promising future for application of the internet to create virtual learning platforms. More online services need to be developed to better support early learning and parenting of children within families. So that is what I want to share. Thank you. No, thank you. And, and, um, and I will move on now to Dina, um, because similarly to Parenting the Future, uh, play is very central to your model, Dina. Uh, it's the core. And so could you please tell us a bit more why SDG focused play-based learning is so important for young le uh, learners? Absolutely. Imagine, I think that the, in one word, I would say it's purpose. We can no longer afford to have an education that doesn't allow us to, to find our purpose. And not only if, in case it's not enough to find our purpose, Imagine finding your purpose in a joyful way. And I refer back to the, the example that I shared in, in the previous speech about Regina, one of the 1.3 people that we have had the privilege to work with. Imagine that you are a, a girl and that you are in a context surrounded by violence, by crime, by poverty, by lots of different challenges. And that will not define you. That will not prevent you from learning that you can be an, an agent of change for something that's beyond you. These sustainable development goals sound like a very abstract and far away concepts. And guess what? We translate them into very tangible actions that we can learn about and address through play. So play it just happens to be, in, in our experience, the most powerful vehicle to really touch hearts. It's not enough to, to train minds and to educate minds. We need to reach to the deepest fibers. And that is really something that play does. So we invite children and teachers and parents to really go uh, and, and reach their, develop all these competencies that, that are so uh, well known, no? The collaboration, the, a critical thinking, a systemic thinking for sustainability. And the sustainable development goals are something that children, parents, and teachers that we have been so uh, honored to work with all these years can not only tell you what they are, they, are, they can tell you what they are doing to address them. And they didn't learn this through fear or threat. They learn this by playing, by having an experience that informs them why, why do they care? So this is the main thing for an education of, of the present and of the future. We need to understand why we care and learn that in a human way. Thank you. And, and just uh, briefly to all of you, I have a follow-up question. Um, play has been uh, really put uh, and, and at the forefront uh, during the, the COVID uh, pandemic and, and about its importance and also uh, the importance of social emotional learning. So what is in, in uh, really 30 seconds, what is your, your hope for the future of education and how do you see it um, uh, do you see play and cell and, and early childhood education as uh, scaled in the future? We can start with you, Dina. Well, my hope for the future is that, that all teachers and parents and children use a play, reflect, and take action methodology and approach to learn math or any other uh, subject in a fun way and at the same time address climate change and come from a platform of very strong civic values. That will make a, a change. <laughs> Thank you, Sabrina, over to you. What is your hope? My hope is the, the 18 million uh, children in China under uh, three years old, they're really in, in rural areas, they really can face the equal opportunity. 
and uh, no one can left behind and start from day one. Yeah, that's my hope. Thank you. And Leslie? My hope is that as many classrooms as possible and policymakers and governments as possible will start implementing programs like Think Equal, which are the answer to the mental uh, health crises that our children are facing right now. They need it now. They need the emotional literacy. They need the emotional self-regulation, the problem solving, the critical thinking that we teach. But my ultimate hope is that social and emotional learning, the missing third dimension to education should be brought front and center as the core purpose of early childhood education. How can we honestly deem numeracy and literacy to be compulsory in a world where we have computers and spell checks and, and learning how to value another human being is optional? Learning how to have healthy relationships is optional or worse arbitrary. This can't be the case. It needs to be compulsory. Belize, shout out to Belize. Belize is making it compulsory. Think equal for every three to six year old child. We're starting to train the teachers in November. I'm hopeful, I'm optimistic. Thank you, Leslie, and, and thank you, Dina and, and, uh, and Sabrina. I share your hope and uh, hopefully WISE will also offer you a platform to foster collaboration because as you can see, you have so many common interests and, and also uh, hope. I invite now Thana to uh, join me to moderate the second fire chat. And this one will focus on adult learning and community engagement. She will be joined by Deborah, Alexander, and uh, Megan. Thanks, Audrey. Um, I'm really glad to have this opportunity to talk to three amazing organizations and representatives from three amazing organizations that serve marginalized communities and offer adults educational tools that help their agency and their community. All three of you uh, redefine how lifelong learning takes place by ensuring you take into consideration the communities that your learners come from and embedded in. Um, I'd love to start off by asking you, Megan, how do you accommodate different community needs when training the woman that you've selected for your solar and enriched programs? And what are the community level in, impacts um, from having created the solar mamas, as you call them? Sure. You know, our, our model really starts with, with trust and trust that happens on multiple levels in, in multiple ways. And we have really learned that by um, approaching things in a decentralized and in a very bespoke manner, a community by community, listening and trusting in the voice of the community, that that's really where we learn how to do our job for those communities. And so I think that's really where it starts is, is with the woman, with the community. We work in a really entrepreneurial way that allows us to assess the kind of challenges that each community is facing on the ground, be those climate, be those uh, marginalization for some particular reason, or, or even uh, things to do with um, extreme conflict and, and migration issues. And so the women come to us from all over the world with um, all different challenges. And so how do you bring them onto a level playing field where they each can feel uh, equally invested in and equally valued and also that their voices in their own languages and their own cultures are heard and understood. So of course, we really stumbled on technology about uh, six years ago when nobody thought, why would Barefoot College need technology? Um, happily, we had a partner in Apple that listened to us and uh, understood why all of the beautiful technologies which we'd been developing um, suddenly had an application to bring women together to cross language and literacy barriers, to create curriculums that were interactive and were voice activated, highly visual in their content. 
And that just really unlocked our ability to almost immediately bring women not only into high technology skill training, but also into a digital technology a current state where they felt empowered not only by their ability to use technology and construct it, but to actually have it um, allow them to talk and learn from the woman who was staying next to them. So the, the, the impacts of this program on the ground in communities have been extraordinary and they range uh, from everything from obviously better health because people are not breathing in toxic bad fumes anymore because they now have access to renewable energy, but also some pretty substantive impacts on children's education. The um, amount of hours children read in the evening is directly determined by their access to good quality light. And when we're talking about lighting up a whole household of five, six, or eight people, you're talking about then unlocking that opportunity to read and do schoolwork for all the children in the household. In fact, to do economic work for even men and women in the evening when their children are in bed. So it has a really deeply transformational effect on that level. And then of course, there are issues of security. Uh, security dramatically goes up in communities where light is able to be offered. And then of course there is the gender component, which happens when the least likely woman in the poorest community who everybody has written off arrives home to be able to install this amazing technology into the whole community everything changes about what young girls think women are capable of and everything changes about what boys understand women are capable of there's nothing quite like seeing a solar mama standing on the roof putting a solar panel up there and five young men at the bottom of the ladder looking at her with wide eyes they can't quite believe she's actually doing that and i think in one way this practical uh, transition and transformation for people from one belief system to another belief system is very powerful and is really the one that's sustainable and lasts. Sorry, I was muted. <laughs> Thanks for that, Megan. Uh, I think there's something really strong about what you're saying about empowering one adult in a community can empower an entire uh, community and the entire family structure. I'd love to hear um, from your experience, from your experience, Deborah, um, in the informal settlements, how has empowering um, education leaders and how has the coaching element of that empowerment really given uh, more effects on the community at large? Yeah. Thanks, Anna. And it's interesting. We often call coaching our secret sauce, our magic ingredient. And I think We've all, I'm sure almost everybody on this call, you go for a training workshop, a professional development workshop, you get a great lecture or some engaging activities, maybe a, a beautiful handout, you take it home, it sits on your desk. Um, and often that's where the story ends. But coaching really makes sure that that is where the story begins. Because coaching is about bringing that training to life, whatever our school leaders here in our professional development workshops or our leadership academies, it really comes to life when our coaches come to the school, meet with the school leaders one on one and begin to walk that journey with them. That's in walking that journey where the school leader is able to set goals to achieve um, certain things in their classrooms or with their teachers. It's where they're really able to reflect and understand what specific mindsets or competencies they need to work on to be able to improve their entire school. And that coaching relationship is built really importantly on empathy. Each of our leadership coaches is a teacher themselves who've had classroom experience, who understand what it's like to be in the school uh, as a school leader, a classroom leader in the same way that our partner school leaders have. And so they're able to identify with the, the school leaders and teacher leaders that they're working with. They're able to share their own experiences, their own leadership story. And in that, just build a beautiful relationship in which both parties can grow. Um, and that impacts on the teaching and learning throughout the school. And that's what makes coaching so special. 
Thanks, uh, Deborah. That's really, I think the continuation element really does make one of the, is one of the things that really did make uh, Stoisha so interesting. Um, Alex, Alexander, I'm really curious to hear about the kind of communities that you serve because they're, they're really non-traditional learners in many ways. Um, why is it important to include access to rights and legal education for inmates in the population you serve when talking about access to quality education? And how has your approach to adult education and lifelong learning offered them agency? Thanks, Donna. I think one of the things that we've learned is that gifts and talents are spread throughout our communities, but opportunities aren't. We see around the world, in wealthy and poor countries, that prisons are filled with poor people who've often not had access to education. We know that education transforms individuals. It creates confidence and courage and a sense of agency, but it also transforms our communities. I think a community only flourishes when every member of that community has a chance to give their gifts, their talents, for the greater good. So in prison, we see that there are people who are hungry for knowledge, that people who are willing to, um, to gain knowledge to serve their communities. I think about uh, someone like Ruth. Uh, she was arrested when she was in her late teens in Kenya, taken to the Women's Maximum Security Prison. She said that she felt suicidal when she arrived there. It happens to be a crime to attempt suicide in Kenya, but that wasn't why she was in prison. Now she's uh, studying for her University of London law degree, having been sentenced to death. But although she's on death row, she says, I have agency as I serve my peers. The knowledge that I'm acquiring is allowing me to transform my community and to reunite families. She makes me think of Susan, who was our first woman to study law with the University of London from the maximum security prison in Kampala, Uganda. Again, she studied from death row, studying under a mango tree. She was one of the University of London's best students in human rights law. And she was a lead plaintiff in a case which got the mandatory death sentence in Uganda overturned. She is now a free woman working to improve conditions for children of those in prison. I think about Moses, our first man to graduate with his University of London law degree. He started his studies as a prisoner and after completing them, he became a prosecutor in the Ugandan army. So we know that education can uh, realize potential that's hidden away or which we can be blinded to. And we know that people who we might look on as being net takers from society or people who are drained on our resources have gifts and talents and ideas. Uh, one of my community members, William, who was on death row for many years in Kenya, says in prison we have brains that can move mountains and we have loud, silent voices. And education is a way to make those voices heard and all of us benefit when that happens. Thank you so much, Alexander. That was that honestly gave me goosebumps. <laughs> um, that was really powerful. Um, I have a question to all three of you, and if we can limit it to 30 seconds in the responses, um, how can we make communities se community centered education a part of the conversation on building the future of education? Um, I think the work that all three of you do is really phenomenal, and, and, and the way that you center communities really has helped your mission move forward. So I'm curious what your opinions are on how we can make community-centered education the uh, part of the conversation at large. So I guess I'll go first, Tana, on that. Um, I think that we have a tendency to, to not take community seriously enough, to not take that self-sustaining mechanism and the informal systems that our communities have richly for many, many, many years as being actually our biggest asset and key to sustainable change. I think we're seeing right now in the wake of this pandemic and, and as it continues to play out in the global south, the communities that have the strongest mechanisms, strongest systems are the ones doing the best and thriving and the most resilient in this, in this moment. And so the question becomes, how do we put them at the table when we're taking decisions? And um, really to have governments in particular uh, beginning to have open dialogue directly with communities on their needs and not sort of afraid to engage I think there's still too much distance, still too much fear of direct engagement, still too much fear in that space where um, we just really need to listen uh, to what communities need from us. And if we're here to serve, 
And that should be our purpose. If we're here to serve, it means we have to be prepared to listen and to react and to accept that possibly the ideas we have of education are not the right ideas for them. Um, and that is a, a tough moment, I think, because you're talking about challenging a lot of institutionalized ideas. Thank you so much, Megan. Um, Deborah, I'd love to hear from you in 30 seconds. Sure, thank you. I mean, I think just building on what Megan has shared, um, Dignitas has been founded on this belief that the answers are in our communities and the people we need to transform those communities are there. For Dignitas, it's the school leaders. They're there. They're already passionate about solving the challenges in their community. They're already passionate about meeting the needs of the children in those communities. And what they need is for us to see them, for us to equip them where we can come alongside them, um, for us to help build their sense of agency um, and, and to really be the ones behind them and beside them as they pursue whatever goal it is they have for their community. And I think then our question becomes, how do we come along beside and behind them? How do we equip? How do we support? Um, how do we collaborate? so that their vision often for the children that we want to serve um, is met and realized. Thanks so much, Deborah. Um, Alexander, I'd love to hear from you. I think when it comes to thinking about who we offer education to, we should be slow to judge and quick to love, not to blinker ourselves. I think about Nelson Mandela, who studied law with the University of London whilst in prison in South Africa. Uh, I think that in the most unexpected places, there are gifted uh, people. Uh, we've seen it in prison, but we're asking, what does it look like to go upstream? In prison, we work with uh, refugees and homeless people, those who've lived in slums or sex workers. And we're asking now, how do we go to refugee camps and to brothels and to homeless shelters to find the bright legal minds there? And our posture shouldn't be that when we go to marginalized communities, we're doing them a favor by offering education, because actually they can transform our lives. They can uh, discover new ways of doing things. We see with the University of London, people in prison are getting some of their highest marks. And so let us consider it a privilege to invite those who are on the margins of our society uh, into our programs, knowing that they'll transform our programs and us as we go. Thank you, Megan. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Sana, Alexander, Megan, and Deborah. Thank you very much. And, and um, we've heard uh, how instilling the right type of skills for an early age is crucial, and that is a continuing process. Also, thank you very much for reminding us about the transformational power of education and the importance of involving uh, communities along the way. So thank you very much for all your great work to all of you. We will now move on to the last part of today, and it will consist um, in an intergenerational dialogue between two innovators. On one hand, the 2017 Wise Prize for Education Laureate, Patrick Awa, and on the other end, one of the 2020 Wise Emerging Leaders Fellow, Juan David Arecibo. Again, Sana, the floor is yours, and welcome, Patrick and Juan. Thanks, Audrey. Um, and welcome Juan David and Patrick. It's nice to have you on this panel. Just a quick introduction for our audience um, about the topic. As universities and colleges have shifted the way they offer their classes during the pandemic, young students are questioning the necessity of brick and mortar universities for their success, especially when costs and access to higher ed institutions remain high. Um, with COVID becoming a reality throughout this year, the African University Association has signaled that very few universities across Sub-Saharan Africa were prepared to offer content for their students online. Um, Patrick, I'd love to hear from you, based on your experience with Ashesi, how can higher ed institutions innovate and provide learning for more students um, despite the digital divide exacerbated by COVID? Well, I can share uh, our experience at Ashesi, um, especially with the digital divide. Um, you know, we have a very diverse student body. And so as you can imagine, we had students uh, who lived in many different circumstances. And actually, when we think about the digital divide now, especially as it pertains to learning online, 
we think about more than just technology, which is, which is very interesting. We didn't expect that. So we, of course, thought about how do we get bandwidth to students in remote areas? How do we make sure they all have laptops so they can engage learning online? Those are the things that you normally think about when you think about um, access to online learning. But what we found was that there, there's this other set of problems, right? So if somebody, for example, lives in a small hut, um, or a small cabin uh, shack with a family of 10. Um, and that person is having to take a class online. How do they do it? There's just so many distractions around them, right? If somebody is work living in an environment where because they're home, they suddenly have household chores, like going to fetch water at the river, how do you make sure that they have access to online content? So it turns out that there's this other set of social um, issues that we have to address. We have to help some of our students move to uh, different circumstances where they could have a quiet space to study. We had to engage with parents to give students time to, to learn. Uh, it's a very broad spectrum of things that we have to do to move online beyond having the systems of the university and beyond getting technology and data to our students. Thanks for sharing that. Um, I think it's a really valuable experience that many of our audience can probably relate to on different levels. Um, and even through these issues, um, some universities have decided to move to a more blended um, model or to a model that um, where some courses are online and some courses are in person um, that kind of leaves the issue of which base which skills are they getting on campus and which skills are they getting online or offline and to dig deeper into the issue I'd love to ask uh, Juan uh, what are the values and skills necessary to kind of live in today's experience uh, in today's environment um, you call yourself a uh, a talent manager of young people. So what are the skills and talents that um, you're looking to manage in young people? Thank you. Thank you, Tan. It's a pleasure to be here with you and with Patrick. Um, for sure, young professionals struggle to upskill and reskill and remain relevant in the economy that we have right now. And that's why uh, our program, as, as you said, we are talent managers because we try to uh, help them to achieve their goals. So we create boot camps. Uh, we give them the loans so they can access to education. Um, but at the end, always is, is a discussion about doers or thinkers. And sometimes it, the education is between that. If we have to uh, explain and to try to have these kind of skills where they, they think better about what is happening in the world, but sometimes uh, teachers or parents, they said, I want to have my kid to be a do doer. So sometimes that kind of division doesn't help to improve the skills of our young people. Because I think there is no debate between thinkers and doers. We have to be both. We have to think. We have to really um, create in our mind what is ahead of us. But also we have to uh, create the skills and the abilities to make the change happen. That's why I think both are so necessary to have these kind of people that they respond to the problems, uh, they, they know what kind of solution is better, but also they, they know how to work in teams, they have a creativity, uh, they have the creativity to solve them. So I think if, if I have to divide the, the two main skills or the two mindsets that we need with young people, is thinkers and doers. And why is that is because part of the problem of young people around uh, the world in Latin America, in Europe, in the States, um, in Asia, it's employment. So the best way to address unemployment is to work on those skills where they know how to solve the problem and also they, they solve it and they work to have solutions for what is happening in their lives. 
Thanks, uh, Juan David. I think I think the distinction between thinkers and doers is interesting. Um, and I'm curious to hear from Patrick how uh, you train your students because you guys have a focus at Ashesi on creating ethical leaders. So your value system goes even beyond thinkers and doers. The values of ethics are really focused. Uh, and how are you kind of managing getting that those values and that skill set, if it is one, to students in an online setting when kind of attention to screens might be minimal? That's a very interesting and, and, and powerful question. Um, so let me just first say that um, we're so glad that before we had to move to an online format, we had a campus culture around integrity that students had promised to to themselves to, and to the faculty that they were going to sort of learn and act in an, in an ethical way with high integrity, to not cheat in exams. And the mantra that they've had was that they, they promised to do the right thing when no one was watching, right? But once we moved online, it occurred to us that actually what was occurring on our campus by not having proctored exams, where students were doing the right thing when the faculty were not watching, but their peers were watching, right? And now that they're all learning at home, now truly no one is watching. You're at home, doing a course online, taking an, doing assignments online, taking an exam online, and there's nobody there with you. Um, and you know, it's occurred to us that this is the real test. And we'll see, you know, at the end of the semester, whether our students will actually pass this test when they truly have nobody watching, not even their peers. I'm optimistic that they will, um, because they've had, you know, students that are most of the students online now had, you know, years of sort of bonding with each other on campus first. Now, the really interesting group for us is the freshman class, the, the, the first year students who did their orientation online. They started their classes online, completely online, without having that sort of bonding experience on campus. And it's a very interesting question. I don't know the answer to that yet, but there's a part of me that feels that there's a great value to having people living and working and learning together that we're missing in the online world. And um, we're figuring out how to how to navigate that, frankly, but we'll see. Ask, ask me in about six months. I'll definitely make a note of asking you in six months. I'm really curious myself uh, to see where you stand on this after that uh, freshman class experience. Um, I, I have a question that kind of goes to both of you. Um, this pandemic has made one thing very clear and that the future of work that spectators have been talking about for the past 20 years it's already arrived. The economy has changed. The skill sets necessary have changed, and people have worked from home. Um, it might. It, it's not necessarily due to automation or other things that um, things have changed. But my question is, um, what innovations can allow students in lower resource settings to stop catching up, but rather come up with their own opportunities in this global world? So I'll, I'll, I'll go first. Um, so one of the things that we learned from our students early on, um, earlier in the year, was moving online had actually helped them to, be, to become more independent, right? So, so now they were on their own and they were having to do a lot more just on their own. Um, and this is a positive thing. We also have heard that um, you know, the part of our curriculum um, and the engagement of Shesti that is so um, involved with teamwork um, is challenged, right? And, but there are tools that are helping with that. There, there are collaborative tools like Slack or Teams or you know, Google Docs and Office 365 that are helping teams organize more together online across geographies and across time. Uh, for things that uh, teamwork that does not involve hands-on application. For teams work that, that teamwork that involves hands-on application, like laboratory um, uh, 
experiments or uh, lab work, that's been obviously a complete challenge. We've had to send engineering kits to students' homes, and they're doing engineering projects by themselves at home. And we're having to do things, and for, for, for projects that require heavy machinery, we are innovating by having um, you know, a technician in a workshop running the heavy machine and sort of running it live, people, students watching it live um, for now. And the next step that we're gonna do is have that technician maybe make mistakes and have students have to correct and so on. But um, it's very clear that having a means to have uh, live online interaction with somebody doing the hands-on work and having input from others watching is going to be a skill that we need in the future. And you can just imagine just in many different fields, whether it's engineering or medicine or other things like this, that the ability for, for people to watch closely and to have a very quick real, you know, real time interaction with the person doing the work is going to be very important for team collaboration. Yeah. Yes, and I and I think uh, one of the, the the discoveries that we have seen with our students is their entrepreneurial mindset, is how they solve problems in their own community using the 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 the, the, the technology that they have, and this is very important because uh, what we are seeing is, for example communities in rural areas, what they are doing is to create a community to push the public agenda so they have better internet or better access to computers in their own community. So there is a lot of leadership there. So when you uh, help your students to improve their own entrepreneurial mindset, um, they will achieve these kind of uh, actions where they push the agenda to have better tools to create the education uh, environment for them. Second, I think radio and television is going to be very important in the future. And that is very weird from someone in my generation talking about radio or TV. Um, because when I talk with my students, when they talk about television, they think about uh, YouTube or they think about computers. They don't think on, on a big machine. But um, what, what you see in, in so many families in Latin America and in the world is they spend a lot of time watching television, the regular television. There are a lot of hours watching television, the regular television. And, and, and one of the mainstreams that we can use there is to create better content using entertainment from ordinary television or ordinary radio shows. And I think sometimes what happens with us, that I mean with us, that we are involved in education, sometimes we don't talk to media and we don't engage with media to create content to the old media uh, platforms. And the third, I will say the internet of things. What we are seeing is um, machines putting together to work, to, to, to really monitor what is happening in the environments with the students. Of course, uh, now it's very expensive, but in the future, what is going to happen is we are going to have uh, gadgets that are, will, will allow us to understand better what is happening with our students. Uh, even if we are in a classroom or even if they are in another city or in another town, we can have, thanks to those sensors, what they are feeling. And thanks to that, we can have real and uh, live feedback about what is happening to them. So mixing the three, the, the, the three uh, things that I, that I am saying is, First, this is entrepreneurial mindset. They should be the ones, young people should be the ones who tell us what kind of tools they need to learn uh, and we should help them to, to get them. And second is uh, use the old media, television and radio. We should go and work with journalists and TV channels to improve the quality of content. And third, of course, is to engage with the internet of things uh, that will allow us to have feedback online and in real time. Uh, thanks for that. Now, my last question to both of you um, is something that kind of goes in line with the theme of this uh, entire session today about building the future of education. Uh, what's 
something that makes you hopeful about the future of education in your context and um, where do you see it going forward? And if you can make it a uh, quick, please, around 30 seconds each, that'd be great. <laughs> well, the thing that makes me hopeful is that um, young people are really switched on, they're very engaged. And, you know, I see how our students have responded to this pandemic. It's been, I've been very proud of them um, in how they've engaged in sort of switching to a completely different mode of learning that they've been doing and sort of doing it gracefully. Um, but also with, even in cases of, of difficulty, for example, today, um, our Nigerian students are back home and they have protests going on in their country. They remain very connected with their, colleagues here in Ghana, and we see Ghanaian students engaged with them, our students from Cameroon, DRC. And it's just been really interesting to watch how very well bonded uh, these young people are. Even as they've sort of gone back to their countries, um, they're supporting each other um, and still getting their normal work done. So that gives me a lot of hope that uh, there's just this incredible scope for, for people to adapt um, whatever the circumstances are and, and work towards making the world a better place. Yes, and, and I think the, the world is getting older, at least uh, here in Latin America, what is happening is, is getting older. So we are seeing people uh, older than uh, 65 and I see future there. And why is because we can change the way that we understand education. It will start training and educating people older than 65 and engage them with communities and participating more in what is happening, what uh, is happening in society. I think we are going to have the best of society ever. Young people and older people working together and educating themselves uh, is going to help us to create a social capital for a new generation that wants to have prosperity and employment around the world. Thank you so much, uh, Juan David and Patrick. Um, I've learned so much from your valuable experiences and I'm really interested, I've been really interested about what you've mentioned about creating future ready, resilient learners and I'm sure the audience was as well. Uh, thank you, Patrick. Thank you, Juan David uh, and Audrey, the floor is yours. Thank you, it's a pleasure. Yeah, thank you for um, such a rich conversation. And I invite all of you to, to continue it online. It has been very informative, very inspiring to spend those last two hours with you. Um, so thank you very much to all our speakers for being with us and sharing your wise words. Um, before I leave the, the floor uh, to, to Savo Senuka for some closing remarks, I would like to thank all the team that has been working behind the scenes on the awards this year, from the selection to the due diligence to putting uh, this event together. And I would like to address a special thank to uh, Sana. The floor is yours, uh, Stavros. Thanks, Audrey, and, and my own thanks to Patrick, Juan David, and, and Sana for being part of today's uh, celebration of the WISE Awards. Special thanks also to Dana Al-Fardan and Nadim Naman for allowing us the privilege of previewing two very moving and inspiring compositions. Um, thank you also to the whole of the WISE team, our pre-jury and jury for all the work they did to help us get from over 600 applications to our six winners. Um, and of course, again, many congratulations to the recipients of the 2020 WISE Awards. The awards is WISE's oldest and arguably most popular program, having just completed its 12th cycle. Our six winners have amply demonstrated why that is the case. You are really an inspiration to us all. Now at, at WISE, we recognize that in order to keep the world's promise of quality education for all, we still have much work to do. And so as has been our practice for the past several years, I want to end my remarks, uh, end this evening's uh, event by announcing that applications for the 2021 WISE Awards are now open. Thank you everyone uh, for being with us tonight. There's a short video and we're going to wrap up.
Are you working on an education project that is transforming people's lives? Is it benefiting your community? Is it a model that can inspire others? Each year, the WISE Awards celebrate six groundbreaking education projects for their excellence and share them with the world. Apply for the 2021 WISE Awards. WISE, an initiative of Qatar Foundation.